How you doing? Feel good, bud. How you been? I've been good. It's been a long time. I was trying to think when the last time you and I actually had a conversation. It's been what, like 18 years? <laughs> long time. Yes, it has. Years. Yeah, it's been a wild ride for sure. Uh, come a long way since uh, Matt Thornton's JKD gym in downtown. <laughs> <Florida>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, but uh, yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely part of my roots is is uh, getting to meet you, getting to meet Nate Corey, Robert Fallis, a bunch of those guys that became staples in, in my journey, staples in my training. You know what they say, you're only as good as the guys you're rolling with, the guys you're, you're wrestling and, and training with every single day. And you guys were a big part of that foundation for me. So I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, well, as I've said many times before, you filled in a – the piece of the curriculum that we were missing, which was the, the clinch and put, put that part together for us. Yeah. So, I, I get to, uh, I get to still talk to you and see Bert Richardson every once in a while, which is somebody that I met through you at, at yeah. some of the camps that we used to do at, at straight blast. And yeah. uh, he, he's constantly posting up stuff about, about the clinch and about a lot of the stuff that we worked on 20 years ago and still going strong. So it's pretty amazing to see. It is. Your fight with uh, Vitor is what really brought, in my mind anyway, brought Greco to the forefront of MMA. I don't think we'd really seen a lot of Greco before that. And that's been, what, what year was that? That was in the 90s, yeah? It was, uh, that was October of 97 when I fought Vitor the first time. And I think that was kind of the first time dirty boxing yeah. uh, was directly from clinching and Greco-Roman wrestling with Matt Lennon and Dan Henderson. I mean, we, you know, we trained either at your gym or, and that's around the time we started Extreme Couture, uh, not Extreme Couture, Team Quest, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Team Quest. And, uh, you know, we, we pushed each other and beat the hell out of each other every day and kind of came up with that clinch and hold and circle technique to, to be able to punch from that clinch position. And, uh, it certainly worked and paid dividends in that fight with Vitor. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're doing movies now. I have uh, had a, a, an amazing opportunity. You know, back in 1999, 2000, they called the UFC and wanted authentic cage fighters for a, a scene in a major motion picture called Cradle to the Grave with Jet Li and DMX. Okay. And I was one of the guys they called. Me, Tito, and Chuck are all three in that movie in these underground fight scenes. It was kind of my first time being on a set, seeing the whole thing, seeing the, how, you know, movie magic, how, how they pull all this off. We, we spent seven days working on that scene, you know, 12, 14 hours every single day for that one five-minute little part of that movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, was, it was eye-opening. It was, it was pretty interesting. And we became immediately intrigued with the process went out and got, uh, uh, took some acting classes mm -hmm. and eventually got an, uh, an agent I'm with the Gersh agency, Brett Nornsberg at Gersh. She's been my agent since I started this. So over 20 years ago now, it's crazy. That's very cool. You're looking at the sport now, like so it was 97 with that fight with Vitor. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the biggest changes you see now? Well... The, the market is a little saturated, in my opinion. It's become very corporate. Mm -hmm. and I think that started with, with Zufa and the UFC buying the company. I think we, we needed someone like them that had the savvy to, to repackage our sport, mm -hmm. take it away from the fringe, a little less spectacle, a little more authentic sport. Mm -hmm. and, and they had the savvy to do that. Not only the savvy, but the pockets, because let's be honest, Promoting is, is expensive, very expensive. So, um, you know, Lorenzo Fertitta was the athletic commissioner in, for the state of Nevada for quite a while. Uh, so he knew exactly what he was looking at in mixed martial arts and saw the opportunity. Uh, they revamped and, and uh, you know, ran towards regulation, towards unified rules and getting it sanctioned in all 50 states, a whole bunch of things that, uh, in my opinion, SDG just didn't have the ability the no, know, the know with all to, to do. And uh, so, you know, obviously, that fight back then, my very first fight was UFC 13. We had the weigh ins in the lobby of the Holiday Inn in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, and, you know, the event was at the Civic Center, which held maybe 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah. That was the first time I saw my opponents was when we stepped on the scale in the lobby of that hotel. Uh, now look at it. I mean, they're cordoning off most of the arena, putting it on ESPN. It's on the ticker, a right. stage, six, 7,000 people showing up just for the weigh-ins. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's progressed and, and changed remarkably since back then. I mean, what we call it back then, NHB, right? No holds right. barred. There were only a couple of rules involved, really. No eye gouging, no grunt striking, no throat striking, and no fish hooking. Right. Most didn't even know what a fish hook was. Right, right. So, you know, and it seemed like every show back then, there was a new, new rule or a new couple rules right. added to the event. Uh, and then eventually, obviously, in, in 99, we ran and got regulated in the state of New Jersey. They were the first to recognize unified rules. And, and really kind of standardize what everybody was doing in this sport. And, and it became a lot more legitimate then. That's when guys like Senator McCain were speaking out against us and trying to run us down, I think, because boxing was scared. They were getting nervous. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was an interesting time. And, and, I mean, what a cool thing to be a part of, to see this yeah. whole thing grow. Look at it now. There's two or three fights on every single weekend now. Yes. So. Uh, that's what I mean about kind of a saturation in the market. Hell, there are 70 or 80 percent of the fighters that I don't know who they are. I don't know where they came from or where they trained. You used to know every single guy in the sport back yeah. then. So it, it's changed considerably. Yeah. What do you think about the technical aspects of it now? Like when you see clinch now with the with the young champions and stuff, what you, you see it's been on a, a positive I, higher level or? degraded or how do you think it's happened? I think on the whole, it's absolutely at a higher level. I think we have a better level of athlete. They're more technically well-rounded. It's a little less. So this guy's really good at this thing, but he's not really good at anything else. Yeah. These five work diligently over the last 15 plus years to become well-rounded mixed martial artists. The striking is amazing. The submission skills are there. The wrestling, you're seeing way more guys practice wrestling that they didn't do that before. Mm -hmm. Greco is still a bit of an anomaly. It's not a very popular style unless you're in Eastern Europe. Certainly in the, in the U.S., there's not very many pl places to get exposed to it, frankly. Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of guys out there that are taking advantage of that style and the clinch game and being able to operate from that attached position. Right. Some of the Thai guys, I think, you know, have done or can do re really well in MMA using Thai technique. And that – that was the interesting thing for me as I started to study Thai and, and incorporate Thai, all the similarities to Greco and using your hips, breaking guys' balances, off-balancing guys. There were so many similarities. It yeah. was hard to me. It was like, wow, this is just exactly what we do in a Greco match. So, yeah. um, But I don't really see anybody taking advantage of that the way that myself or, or Henderson or Linlin, Chael yeah. Sonnen, some of us guys that came from that solid Greco background we're able to do. Yeah. You know, coincidentally, just the other day on uh, Facebook, Gerard Mayu messaged me, and I don't know if you remember him, but he was the Thai guy that came from Union Island. Well, he's not Thai, he's French, but Thai boxer that came from yeah, Union Yeah. And you, you guys pummeled for like an hour. Yeah, I remember. Good. Yeah, he was he's a real good clinch guy for the Thai clinch. It was very cool to see all the similarities and everything fit together so well. Yeah, yeah, it was it was stark to me. It really stuck out, and I got the chance to work for quite a long time with a guy named Quinton Chong out of Cape Town, South Africa. He, you know, I met him shooting a movie down there. Went to his gym a bunch of times. Went to some of his smokers. He was putting on smokers in his gym, and we became very, very good friends. He moved to the states for almost a year and lived in my house and trained me every single day in Muay Thai. He trained me for the Nogara fight and and uh, the Brandon Vera fight. Um, in that kind of stretch of my career. And, and I, was, I learned a ton from him and had just a blast working specifically on my Muay Thai skills. Yeah. So you, how old are you now? 57? 57, that's right. Yeah, I just turned 52, hard to believe. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it goes fast, doesn't it? It does, it does. Are you still training? Still training. Count? Yeah. I'm not doing a lot of hard sparring anymore. The the, oh. the discs and the neck just they're, they're they're fed up with my shit, frankly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I you know I still roll, still do some light sparring uh, here and there because it's fun. It keeps me sane. Yep. It's a lot more fun than than just going in and pushing weights around or or doing any of that stuff. Yeah, I don't ever see a time when I I'm not going to want to roll. 
Anyway. I hear you. Yeah. So, but that like 90% of the questions I got are, I, I mostly just wanted to catch up with you and not do a long list of questions, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this because so many people ask over and over again, primarily because I think you were probably the only fighter I can think of who the majority of your whole career when you were a champion, you were in your forties. So the question people are constantly asking uh, about you is longevity and how you trained and did that at that age. Yeah. Well, I didn't start the sport until I was 33, almost 34. Mm -hmm. um, half of my career was my 40s. I fought from till I was 47. I fought for 14 years. And uh, I think because I had still been competing at a high level on the national team in Greco and, and in wrestling, uh, you know, going to the nationals, going to the trials every single year, you know, going through camps, national team camps and stuff, my fitness level was still very high and I was still competing at a high level on the wrestling mat. So when I transitioned to MMA and juggled both of those balls for a while, uh, I think it allowed me some longevity that, that maybe if I was an athlete that wasn't in that high or, you know, good a shape, mm -hmm. I might not have been able to go as long as I went, honestly. It's so hard to say. There's so many variables. Genetics plays a role. I've, I've, I think I've been very fortunate. I haven't had any serious injuries that took me out for very long. Um, you know, the knees held up, the, you know, most of the joints held up and that's what I see guys get hurt. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing I see is, is this big upswing and downswing. They train, they peak for a fight and then they celebrate and don't train for three, four weeks. And there's this big dip and then they get another fight. So now they're back on the training journey and, and it's that big lull in the bottom when now they're trying to get their body back in shape so they can get back up to fight shape to go compete where I see these injuries start occurring. Yeah. They're putting a lot of stress on their bodies because they're not maintaining a more constant level fitness level when they're not staring a fight in the face. And, uh, and I, I just love to train so much. It was a blast being in the gym, especially learning jujitsu and learning Muay Thai and all this other stuff that I'd never done. I felt like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't wait to get back on the mat. And I think that regularity, I didn't, I was older, so I didn't didn't need to go out and party or celebrate or any. You know, I was already with the people I, that I cared about and, and that cared about me. Um, a lot of that went away when I was in my twenties, and I look back and think, man, imagine what I might have accomplished in in a sooner time frame had I not been celebrating as much as I was in my early twenties up through my mid mid twenties. You know, maybe if I'd have been more dedicated in those in between times. I would have peaked and, and, and accomplished some things earlier in my career, but I did it the way I did it. And, and I can see and recognize the difference between the two states of mind. Mm -hmm. when, you know, in, in my thirties, I was very focused. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Chasing girls, going to the clubs or partying wasn't part of that at all. So I think, you know, you can't burn the candle at both ends. You stay focused, burn it as hot as you can burn it on one end and let the rest of that stuff go keep your fitness level high, even in between fights. That's when you learn new skills and put yeah. yourself in new situations. Not when you're getting ready to fight somebody, but in those in between times when you don't have an opponent staring you in the face. I think that's when you make your most growth, have the most fun, try the most new things you can try and try to make them yours and implement them into your style, who you are. Uh, I think I'm glad and fortunate that I, I didn't get into this sport till I was 33, almost 34. I was an adult. I was settled in who I am and what I wanted and what my goals were. And none of the other stuff got in the way. And I think if I'd have done, tried to do this in my late teens or early 20s, it might have been a different deal. I might have been distracted by the fame, by a bunch of the other crap that kind of comes with this public world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Well, it makes total sense. I mean, the short answer I usually tell people is you never stop training. So, you know. That's the truth. Yeah. Um, I, I trained all the time. I just lived in the gym. I loved it. Even when I didn't have a fight staring me in the face, I was going in there every day and mm -hmm. trying new stuff out, putting, putting myself in new situations. You know, sometimes that came back and bit me in the ass. I, you right. know, I was so focused on jujitsu because I didn't know anything about it yeah. that I was putting myself on, on my back and, and letting guys take me down and put me on the bottom when nine times out of 10, they probably couldn't really do that. But if right. I put myself in that situation, now I have to operate from there. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think that, that led to me losing to Josh Barnett. You know, 
that was my first loss in, in MMA, my first loss in the UFC. Yeah. And, and you know, I'd been working so hard on my guard and submission skills and all this stuff in jujitsu that when we got into a scramble, I pulled guard and pulled that big guy on top of me, which was a horrible idea mm-hmm. uh, and cost me the fight. Yeah. And I think it was at that moment and in the adversity of, of losing that, that it forced me to analyze why and what, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? What, you know, nine times out of 10, I don't think Josh could take me down. Right. I pulled guard and pulled him on top of me. What, you know? Um, So that forced me back into wrestling, back into Greco, back into, you know, catch wrestling, honestly, because catch as catch can was the oldest, one of the oldest sports there is. And, And a lot of the submission holds in, catch wrestling are the same submission holds that the jiu-jitsu guys are using mm-hmm. so that that adversity forced me to refocus and get back into a wrestler's mindset and make those guys take me down or hold me down if they were able uh and and let go of some of the jiu-jitsu stuff that, that i was trying to catch up with and trying to learn sure at the same time the jiu-jitsu was a probably a good thing when you fought randleman absolutely and that was the difference in that fight yeah i had spent time on my back Mm -hmm. i knew how to use my legs and and incorporate those large levers and protect myself there almost caught him in a submission hold and then when the tables turned and i took him down in the third round he he did the dying cockroach he stuck his legs and arms up and let me climb the full mountain and and the fight was over so that was absolutely a difference in in that fight was i was diligent recognized my weaknesses in the areas that i wasn't that that skilled at yet and uh Spent a lot of time working on that. So absolutely two sides of that coin. For sure. For sure. How's Dan Henderson doing, by the way? Dan's doing well. Um, had a couple discs replaced in his neck, uh, but is happy he did it. Still running his gym in Temecula. Um, doing very, very well there. I think he's in right in the process of opening a big brewery and restaurant attached to his gym, which is a pretty cool idea there in Temecula. So excited yeah. for him, excited for, for what he's doing with that. Um, you know, he had an amazing run too. I mean, he, he went longer than I did. Um, yeah, yeah. But a lot of ways. You know, it brings up uh, a kind of a sad story too is uh, Robert. Yeah, uh, definitely one of those things that, I mean, you knew Robert as well as I did. That's how I met Robert was through you and uh, his history, his history with his family, you know, what happened with his brother of, of well, I think, just three years before before he took his life, before he did what he did. It had a profound effect on him. And the thing with Robert was he was this philosopher, this Tony Robbins-type disciple that affected so many people in such a positive way. Mm-hmm. And then to have him go out like that, I think, was a big shock to all the people in the school, all the people that had ever knew him and had ever been touched by him. Um, so it was, it really, really caught a lot of people off guard. I'd, I'd like to say I was surprised, but I, I was a little closer to Robert and knew some of the ups and downs, especially since his brother passed and how that affected him profoundly and saw that just kind of unfold. Unfortunately, you know, I don't, I don't think there was anything any of us could have done for him. Yeah. He had, pretty much made up his mind this was what was going to happen and he was pretty slick about pulling it off frankly um it was devastating think about him all the time i see the guys at the gym dennis davis and eric nixick and my son and all the other people misha tate just coming out of retirement now i mean misha came to us because of robert followed robert to extreme couture uh to continue being mentored by him so yeah that was a pretty pretty big ripple effect in the water for a lot of people, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, we had a memorial for him, both at team quest and here at extreme couture. And yeah, there's a lot of folks that miss him to this day. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, anybody that has a gym with more than a few hundred people is going to probably run into a situation like that. And, and the thing is you can't, it's always surprising. You know, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any good warning signs for it. Yeah, you don't always know what's going on on the inside of somebody. They can put up a pretty good facade and, and seem like they got their, their shit together and, and they're doing all right, but you just don't know uh, what's really going on with them. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't agree with, with the act in, in what he did and how he went out, 
I think in that you take everything that you're struggling with and you multiply it by 10 and you dole it out to every single person that you know that loves you. Mm -hmm. And that's a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's my honest opinion. Obviously, we see it all the time with our, in our veteran community, and I work a lot in our veteran community. The, the, the statistics there are pretty astonishing. And uh, so I, I've seen the cycle, unfortunately, a, a bunch, and, and it's never easy to deal with. Some of the other SPGs have some pretty big fighters coming out of them, like Connor, obviously. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, what do you think of his career so far? Well, you know, he's in, in some ways in a perfect example of, of some of the issues in our sport. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, he's a perfect example of the potential for anybody who wants to get into this sport and be successful. You know, I'm not a fan of the extracurricular activities mm -hmm. that seem to be swirling around him outside of the cage, but I do admire the way he backs it up and steps up in there and competes, mm -hmm. win or lose. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been impressed with him um, that way, technically, tactically, how he fights, his dynamic style of fighting. And, and I think, you know, we all saw potential glaring weakness in his ground game and nobody had really been able to exploit it. Chad Mendez, I think was the closest to coming to it. Diaz had him in some spots and obviously beat him once, uh, with, I think his ground game more than anything else. Uh, but Khabib kind of had that, that magic combination. He had the ability to really be smothering. And obviously it's a style that I, that I like a lot because it, it's a similar style to what I used to do. And, and, uh, He's a pretty impressive wrestler and pretty impressive how he's implemented that into his fighting style. Mm -hmm. um, Connor venturing out into boxing, getting a license in the state of California as a boxer, again, shined a light on, on some of the issues in the sport of mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. Boxers are, are protected under federal legislation by the Muhammad Ali Act from promoters like, all, like Bob Arum, Don King, we we don't enjoy those same protections. There's no transparency in our sport. Boxing is forced to have that transparency since 1996 when the Ali Act was founded and uh, eliminates the exclusive contracts and a bunch of the other crap that used to go on in boxing that doesn't and still goes on in mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. The contracts in our sport are, are relatively horrible for the athlete. And you show me another professional sport in our society where – 13 to 15 percent of the revenue that comes in from that sport goes to the athletes that fought on that card. That's ridiculous, but that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. uh, most other professional sports, it's at least 50 percent of the of the revenue. Football players are making 51. Most boxers are between 60 to 70, sometimes 75 percent of the revenue from any one boxing event goes to the athletes that competed on that card, mm -hmm. and we're 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 lagging way behind in that regard. Uh, you know, I think we've been pushing to amend the Muhammad Ali Act, just the definition from boxing to combative sports athlete. And then there's some of the language in there with rounds and other stuff that, that's specific to boxing that would have to change just a little bit to accommodate all combative sports athletes. It's a really simple fix, but eliminates some of these horrible, very restrictive contracts and exclusive contracts and would open up free agency a lot more and give us some minimum criteria for, for treatment of athletes and pay of athletes uh, that fight in mixed martial arts or grappling. Grappling is becoming very big. The pay-per-views in, in, in grappling have, are, are doing really well. So they would be covered by that same thing. So uh, I think that's, that's the next step in, in improving what's going on in our sport. You can't have made the UFC very happy by promoting that, huh? No, they're lobbying against us and spending a ton of money to keep us off the floor and all, away from a vote. Um, yeah. Frankly, you know, I think the, the strong relationship between Dana White and, and President Trump kept us, kept us from getting it to a vote. The lobbyists did their job, spent about three plus million dollars to keep us from getting to vote on it because Democrat or Republican, either, either side that I spoke to, we had over 60 sponsors for, for that amendment. And uh, we were headed towards getting a vote and then somehow it got derailed and pushed to a different committee, um, which didn't make any sense. We were in the committee that founded the Ali Act in the first place. That's where it should have been. Right. But the lobbyists, again, doing their job, got us sent somewhere else where we basically had to start almost all over. Um, 
so we were very close, I think, to, to getting it done. And it, it's as plain as the nose on your face when you explain it to somebody. Um, so, I mean, that's the easiest, I think, way to change in a positive way the, the sport and, and the sport for the athletes. Yeah. Speaking of politics, what do you think of what you've been watching going on in Portland the last year? It's been insane, man. Uh, you know, my daughter's Amy still mm-hmm. still lives up there in, in East County in, in Portland area. And so obviously I've been very aware, very, very aware of everything that's going on down there. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's amazing to me. I just, I don't understand it uh, in, in many ways. I just have a lot of trouble understanding it. Um, not to get too crazy and, and open up that political rabbit hole. Cause once you go down there, it's, it can be difficult to get back out. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I just think the handcuffs need to come off and, and the rule of law needs to be enforced and come back and be enforced. It's that simple. Yeah. Uh, in, in many ways. Yeah. It is that simple, I think. Well, um, what advice would you have for yourself if you could go back to the beginning of your MMA career? What would you oh, change? Gosh, I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's – a single thing that I would change. I, I don't have any regrets. Um, I'm thankful for all the people like yourself that I got to meet along the way and learn from along the way. That's been the best part of this whole journey is all these people that I've gotten to kind of accumulate and, and learn from and get to meet uh, along the way. Yeah. Um, there are parts of being in the public eye that I could certainly live without that have taken an adjustment for my family and myself um, that I don't know if I'll ever get used to kind of feeling like you're always under scrutiny. You're always, you always have eyes on you everywhere you go. And, uh, you know, I have to be careful with my kids. You know, you mentioned my daughter, you know, you just, you got to be careful nowadays. And uh, I don't know if that's something I'll ever, you know, there's an upside and a downside to everything. Right. And, yeah. and that's kind of the downside to this whole thing has been being forced into the public eye in, in that scrutiny. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty simple most of the time. I, I don't worry about it too much. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, and we'll, I'll close it up here. What would, you, what would you say to the young fighters that are watching and listening? And, and what would your advice be to those guys? The next I think, First of all, follow your passion. Follow your heart. If you don't have a passion for this, if you're trying to do this to make a paycheck or you're trying to do this to be famous, you're doing it for the wrong reasons and you're not going to last long. It's a very tough way to make a living. If you don't have an absolute passion in your heart for this sport and getting out there, being more vulnerable than you've ever been in your life, walking up in that cage, then, then you're in it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Get a good team. You're only as good as the guys that you're training with, that you're working out with every single day. And, yes, they should push you to the limit. Uh, but at the same time, take care of you. They're not out to prove that they're better than you at anything. You work together. You coach each other. You make each other better. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I think those two things will get you where you need to be. Yeah. Yeah, that's solid. Well, Randy, I appreciate you doing the podcast. It's been, uh, like I said, I think it's been 18 years. So we'll have to do another one, but sooner than 18 years. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it was great to to hear from you, and and, uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's great to talk to you again, my friend.